I'm Paul Finch, Programme Director of the World Architecture Festival, and it's my pleasure once again uh, to talk to uh, Paul Flowers, who is Head of Design at Grower, which is part of the Lixel Group, uh, a huge Japanese conglomerate. And we're going to talk today really about uh, the conference theme of the festival this year, which is 50-50. Looking backwards, really not so much at how people used to do things, but when they were doing those things, what were they thinking about the future? And what are we thinking about the future today? Uh, welcome, Paul. I imagine that when you were at design school, you were yeah. taught by people uh, who were actively taking part in the events of the 1960s, uh, or at least had a good memory of them. Um, what does that mean to you today as a designer, the whole 60s thing? I guess, I guess um, looking back um, at design, design was very much hands-on, particularly in product design. So I think it was, there was a heavy emphasis around uh, ergonomy, and um, making models and physical objects. It was really all about the physical in that period. So whereas now it's a lot of things are digital and they're content driven, in that period I think they, everything was very physical, very tangible. So uh, the approach to teaching I think at, at colleges and universities, as you say, from people who actually practiced probably in the 60s, 70s, uh, was, I would say, was, was much more physically driven. And there was a tremendous optimism um, in the 1960s, which one sees in design and in architecture and in fashion and in film. Was that, do you think, because the era of the war was over and people had just stopped worrying about that sort of thing and were more consumery? Or was it a kind of heart back to the 1930s and life is about pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's always a bit of both. Um, I think, uh, yeah, economic prosperity of that period, I think there was an optimism, there was a concept that um, the future was going to be very interesting. Um, when people looked to the future, I think they were extremely positive about that anyway. There were lots of, I, I think, um, opportunities for creatives in those periods, like you say, everything from music to fashion and, and to design and even architecture. Um, and so I think, and I think we kind of see that happening again, but on a global scale now. So it's very different, because in those in that period, of course, communication was com radically different. I mean, if you wanted to talk to people, you'd have to write a letter and send it off, and you know, correspondence and, and the way people communicate was so different. So I, I think nowadays um, there's still that kind of optimism even today. I think, and even more so, but the the rate of communication and how we interact with each other has just has changed remarkably. And do you think that the, the speculative nature of design itself, that you may know what a commission or a brief is, but there's a, there's a point at which ideas are fluid, you're not quite sure where you're going, and then something crystallises. Do you think that is essentially the same? I mean, one might almost extend it backwards and say that design going back to the, the Renaissance um, uh, has been rather like this, that there are identifiable types of people who want to speculate and be curious. Yeah, I, I guess so. I think, um, so there are still strong individuals, even today, I think, which, which are, are curious, as you say, and, uh, and tend to lead different industries. You can often, even at any point of time, pick, I guess, 10 or 20 architects or designers which seem to be leading a particular movement or seem to be prevalent, let's say. Um, but I think um, in general, in general now we have access to so much information, so much inspiration from travel because people are traveling more than ever, um, from, from let's say digital sources like Pinterest and all those things. All of these different tools and applications are giving people far more access to different routes of inspiration, research. It's so much easier now to do research because of the, the rate that you can, you can access the research and get to the important parts. So it's not like even, I mean, not talking about going 50 years back, but even 20 years back for me as a, as a designer, I've been practicing for 20 years. And 20 years ago to do research, you would literally have to get lots of books out and ergonomy and go to the library and interview people. And now you can just access that information you know, in a heartbeat, it's so much faster. I wonder if this means that in a way, whereas designers had to um, generate and be to, to an extent self-starters in what they were doing, in other words, it was a, a question of finding things out, 
that now it's more like filtering things out, that there is so much that actually the task of editing information and material and inspirations um, has taken over from trying to find them. Absolutely. I think that's a great observation. Um, I think for designers, like you said, there's so much information. Good designers, good creatives, good architects, you know, really filter. And it's still filtered through their personality, through their experience. As design maybe have been led in the past by individuals, it's still an individual that's filtering all that, that's coming to a conclusion. So you're still getting, let's say, the individual touch on that. And the filtering is what makes... Uh, I think a great product, a great building or, or a great environment. Thinking about another aspect of, of that filtering idea, uh, I mean in the, in the past the designers of products were led very much by definition by the manufacturing processes. Yeah. It, it would take generations for a particular process to change. That's not really any longer the case, partly as a result of digital manufacturing technology. And I'm wondering whether in the work that you see in your various various roles, whether actually the question of industrial production has moved to concept and imagination as much as the, the, the kind of physical business of making something, or is that an exaggeration? No, I don't think so at all. I think, um, again, I mean, even when I started my career, it was very much, you know, you'd go to the factory, you'd understand uh, what the factory could produce, the kind of machines they had, the kind of technology they had. And uh, you'd really try to work around those aspects of, of, the, of the company you worked for and, let's say, use the assets they had in place so you could really produce things, let's say, to a realistic cost and time scale. But now it seems to be completely the opposite. I mean, when I design now, I'm not thinking of what we can make in the factory. I'm thinking of what, can, what do people actually need, what do people actually want to buy, what do they actually want to interface with, and then we're finding ways to produce that. And that's just at a period that we're at now. And then, of course, with new technologies coming through, like 3D printing and those kind of applications, where you start to move to not having to invest in huge tooling, um, but individual production, you have so much freedom. that I think it's completely turning the whole manufacturing footprint and how companies think about producing products uh, radically. Now, this is a really fundamental change because it suggests that the designer... Uh, instead of being part of a supply side proposition, which is we make that, it sells, you just tweak around with it a bit. Um, it's more like, well, what could we make? Because we know we could make anything. And with 3D printing, you're moving to the point where you're inventing or exploiting a production process which is remote um, and kind of could be owned by anybody. Mm -hmm. um, how does that actually change the psychology of the designer, do you think? Because on the one hand, it's immense freedom. But on the other hand, with immense freedom, rather like the cartoon of the man with the ball and chain and the chain is snapped and he's actually looking rather worried about what happens next. <laughs> is, is there a sort of concern that because you could do anything, um, actually, what is it that you precisely do? I, th I think there's a huge concern. And when I speak to uh, lots of designers and architects, um, often the worst brief you get is a completely open-ended brief that could be anything because, um, because it's limitless. You don't know really when to stop. And so I think often it's, it's quite stressful to have that kind of brief. It's something that people often crave. They long for an open-ended brief where you can do anything. But when you actually get that thing, I've had it in the past, and it's really stressful because, like you say, you want to keep examining every possibility. And I think the creative process is a bit like a tree in a way. Um, the more branches and stems you go off and examine, even if you come back to the core at the end, I think that kind of exploration makes your final design not only richer, but it gives you a degree of confidence that you've kind of, let's say, worked through all those eventualities, but you've actually decided to go in that direction. So, uh, so yes, I think it's pretty much an accurate observation that the open-ended briefs are, are quite stressful for designers. And in a way, I suppose that for the designer, um, you know, the designer rethinking bathroom technology, in a sense, the client is no longer the manufacturer. The client, in a sense, is the consumer. Yeah. I mean, the consumer has become the demand side um, for <clears> the designer. 
and the manufacturing uh, process is a way of, of satisfying that demand. So the question then is, mm. how, do, how do you as designers find out what that client user really wants? Yeah, I guess it comes on so many levels. Of course, there's a usability aspect, there's a specification aspect, there's a interfacing with people like architects and designers who specify products like the ones we produce at Grower. Um, and, and on top of all of that, you have a layer where, I mean, if I look at our company, how it's evolved, just in the last decade, we've actually changed from, we used to have a concept of water technology, really focusing on the technology to deliver water. Then we moved to enjoy water, which was experience-based. And now we've actually radically changed the whole concept of the company again, having not just faucets and taps, but now we have furniture, lighting, we have steam and spa applications, um, ceramics, because at the end of the day, consumers specify in that way. So we've ha actually had to let's say organically, create a completely new footprint for the company to mirror how people are, are specifying, how people are interfacing with that environment. So it's, it's changed radically what we do, and it's all about, like you said, understanding who's, who's interfacing with your product, insights about the consumer, about the usability, but also about the, the specification, how they purchase this stuff. And this is an interesting um, relationship that's developing between designers and architecture, I mean, in Britain, there's always been this distinction for historical reasons between the design and the architect. Yeah. Whereas in Italy, for example, I mean, it would just be, it's all design. Yeah. And the only question is, it could be an object, it could be a typewriter, it could be a building, it could be a city. <clears throat> yeah. This is surely quite a healthy thing, because the reality is that we don't simply enjoy products as products unless one's a design award, of course, but um, for, for all users, the enjoyment of any product uh, has a lot to do with the entire environment around it. I mean, it's using, as it were, the, the keyboard in an office rather than just the keyboard as keyboard. Absolutely, and I think that's been a, a big shift in, in creativity and design in particular, is looking at that experience. I, I spend, actually, I spend probably as much time with architects as I do with designers, and when people say, you know, where do you get your insights from to develop products? Often a lot of my insights are coming through the, the connection with architects and interior designers, the kind of environments they're specifying, why, you know, how are people navigating through that environment, how are people changing the demographics of, of society, different things. Lots of that information is rich and it comes from, from having, let's say, um, this interface with different, I would say, disciplines like architecture, like interior design like fashion, automotive design, all those things. Are, I think it's quite a healthy, healthy collaboration, actually. Now, because you were across the world um, for the various parts of Grower's parent company, Lixor, you obviously see cultural differences and national differences and language differences. Is there any sense that the, the world of big data, the world of global research and global information about what people are doing and thinking, does that feed into what you do or do you find that actually it's the more sort of intimate experiences of what you've actually seen and talked about in different locations that's more important? I think, I mean, I think that it's nice to have all the access to all this information because at, at the end of the day, you can take what you want. So I think having all the information is important. Um, I see probably more similarities. I mean, I work one week of the, of the month in, in Tokyo, one week in New York, one week in Europe, and it kind of rotates. So, so I'm in those environments and, and let's say, interfacing quite, quite often with different cultures in that way. And I see more similarities, to be honest, and I do differences. But I do see with new technologies, coming back to that concept, that having technologies like digital embedded into products are allowing us, like the content on perhaps our digital telephone, uh, are allowing us to tailor those experiences. Because in any, let's say, um, large company, you still need the economies of scale, you still need mass production um, for products. But being able to tailor those, let's say, experiences with digital technology is really, I think, it's giving us lots of opportunities and allowing us to understand some of those cultural differences, differences in bathing temperatures, differences in the ritual of how you wash and, and even why you wash in those different markets. And you, as a, as a customer of hotels across the world, must be very conscious of 
of at least two strands, which may, be, may, be, may create tension, but it may be creative tension of whether if you're in a hotel in Tokyo, you actually want the same experience as if you're in a hotel in Barcelona, or whether you actually want it to be authentic, if that's the right word, yeah. in whatever location you want to be in. How do you personally, as an inveterate traveller, deal with that? Do you like similarity or do you like difference? I guess I guess it's really I guess it's really that's really a difficult one because I think I bring my own similarity into I have a ritual of how I interface with those environments so that kind of comes from yourself as a traveler and when you're traveling constantly you really you really are ritualistic you really do have things in certain ways in pockets and how you do things um, I still like the fact that there are cultural differences but there are some I think like the values of a person or values of a company, they don't tend to change. So you're looking for similar things. So even if you, you're going into different countries, you're still looking for, a, let's say, a similar set of qualities. And, you know, and, you know quality of, of the materials in, the, in that place, safety even, I mean, cleanliness, some of those things, lighting. I mean, so you may be looking for the, let's say, the cultural interpretation of that, looking for a similar level, I think. And it's interesting here at the festival in Singapore, where they have their President's Design Awards, where they make no distinction between graphic design, product design, architecture, interiors, and so on. But the designers seem to me are recognisable types with recognisable interests that you could transplant more or less anywhere in the world. When it comes to hiring uh, designers within the group and at Grower, do you find that it's pretty multinational these days and that the background of designers and their education is similar enough for you to maximise your choice? Yeah, I guess, I guess so. I mean, I, I think in all of the design studios we have around the world, we tend to, they tend to be multicultural because especially if the brands are, are selling and, and are active in, in different environments. So at Grower, for example, um, they're exporting 80%, let's say, of their products outside of Germany. So the, the design team's incredibly multicultural, and they bring lots of insights, religious insights, gender insights, age insights, all of those things come. And we also even created a, an intern program, a student program, and we started to initially bring students in from, in, from countries where, let's say, they, we weren't represented or we didn't have those people represented in the design team. So even the interns coming in would bring a cultural aspect. So the concept was the design team would teach them really how to design and they would bring a cultural insight, cultural aspect to the team that the team would learn from. So it was kind of, uh, let's say, serving both, uh, both sides. Um, and so, yeah, so I think the, the multicultural aspect is, is very, very relevant. Of course, we do have some brands which only sell in a particular market. Lixil Inax is really selling in Japan. So there we really need people who understand culturally the Japanese market, let's say. So it's not quite as multicultural, say, as, as, as Germany would be. It's great. And looking back across um, different cultures and, and different regions, do you see design and architecture moving at different speeds at different times. I mean, famously, <coughs> in Japan, for example, in the 60s, you had the metabolists who were hugely influential, um, and then they went through a quieter period, and then they came back in certain ways. The same thing in France and, and, and Spain, in fact, in fact, most countries. Do you think that's still operating, where you would go to a country and you think the architecture scene's really hot here, yeah. um, and the design is not so much, or vice versa? I think, I think that still happens, and it's often led by economic prosperity. You can see if there's a slowdown in a certain market, it kind of, you know, creativity seems to die off as people commission less people, less buildings, less architecture, everything slows down. And whereas you have areas which are doing particularly well, which, as a, let's say, as a global company, you see this all the time, when one market cools down, another one's taking off. And then, of course, there's the optimism and more experience. I mean, if we looked what happened in, in Abu Dhabi, Dubai, all those places, I mean, some of the architecture that's come out there is phenomenal. And, um, you know, and it's been a really experimental area, I think, for architecture, um, because of economic prosperity, mainly, of course. So I think, yes, I think you do, you do see aspects of that. You do see aspects of pockets that have periods where they're, they're particularly active. I think we do see that. And there's a sort of follow-up to that, which is the nature of identity in a world of, of, of almost limitless uh, travel 
the internet where all information is available everywhere, especially design information, and everyone knows exactly who's designing yeah. what um, at, at the click of a button. And I wonder whether, um, whether identity as a result of that is now becoming more important, not in the sense of um, you know, having national logos and sort of honey pots with bears on them, yeah. um, but at a slightly deeper level. So for example, thinking about all those countries in the Gulf, um, I mean, how do you give them something which is Gulf-like without, yeah. it, without yeah. it being you know, the, the same difference everywhere? Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, that's, that's a real challenge because, I mean, some companies, of course, I mean, it depends on how they position themselves. Some companies would like to be, let's say, positioned to be more international. Some would like to be more domestic, of course. So it's, it's people's jobs to understand what the, their values are and then creatives, designers and architects to translate those values, which, which is a very difficult thing to do in a meaningful way, translate those values consistently. And, and then, of course, you have brands who, let's say, who interface with multiple markets. And, and then th does the brand itself keep its cultural identity? So, for example, BMW and Audi, they don't change their cars, you know, as they go to different markets. Really, colours, materials, perhaps. Um, the grower brand, we try to keep its German kind of cultural identity of quality, design, technology, sustainability, those aspects. Regardless of the market we go to, we don't try to bend or buckle for that market because I think people are still looking for, especially in a global society where we have access to information, I think people are looking for that consistency in a brand, consistency even in people. You know, it's like your, your core values don't really change. If they do, you're not a really consistent person. And I think that's the same as people looking for companies and, and brands, I think. This is a very interesting point because it, it raises the question of, as it were, if you have the branded product, which is successful because for, all, for all sorts of reasons, why would you change it? But then what happens if you're moving on to a rather wider sphere of, let's say, designing a whole city? Yeah. And this, this uh, I suppose, is what has happened in the Gulf and, and, and in southern China up to a point, which model are you following? Now, as, as designers of products, in a sense, you don't have to worry too much about that because you're able to focus far more on, on very specific things which have a very intimate relationship to yeah. their users. I mean, no more so than in the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I guess so, but I think, um, you know, I always say architecture and design is quite different in terms of, of course, architecture, um, you're dealing with, let's say, a large single project. Let's stay away from the cities right now. That's, mm. that's in particular, that's a huge thing. Um, but a large, a large project, it's all about understanding how that affects the, the environment externally, but also internally as human beings. So how do we move through? How does it affect the, the cityscape? How do, does it affect individuals as they move through? Whereas as, as a product designer, I mean, I, since I started my career, I've literally designed pro hundreds of millions of products. I mean, one of our, one of our ranges that grow, I mean, we sell, you know, four or five million pieces a year of a particular product. You know, and if you were to stack that product up, it would be probably 10 times higher than any building on the planet. So, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's so bizarre. The scale is so different. But, but similar in its magnitude. So when we produce a product that, that's going to be you know, in the hands of two or three million people, which may be in a hotel, which are in the hands of different people, mm. you, start mm. to, you start to have the, let's say, the challenge of really understanding how can that thing be relevant and have the flexibility in that concept to be relevant to so many people. And that's why I say mechanically that's a real challenge. I mean, that's my biggest challenge is to do that mechanically with the team. In a digital sense, it's much, much easier because you can customise. And I suppose the, the point where product design meets architecture, I mean, both literally and, and metaphorically and diagrammatically, is in time uh, and in space. I mean, I'm thinking about the way in which domestic objects uh, are used in the home. Yeah. Now, whoever's created the building envelope has created three-dimensional space, which is, is what architecture does. And product design creates things which 
occupy a piece of three-dimensional space. The interesting thing is that actually the success of the space is going to depend on how people and things are used and move about yeah. in both space and time. And I suppose this comes back to the, in a sense, to the point about branding. It's much easier to brand a product because of the repeat nature of it and the repeated usage of it Whereas buildings, it's quite difficult to brand them, it's a this home or it's a that home. Actually, um, well, you can only be in one at the same time, whereas millions of people can be using yeah. one of your products in every sort of different environment uh, uh, in the world. Yeah. And I suppose in a way, you're, you're, therefore, your design relationship to architecture is quite a complex one because at certain points, it's going to be far more important to the, the client that your shower works than that the three-dimensional space of the bathroom, you know, is a golden section. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I guess, yeah, there are, there are elements in, let's say, that user, uh, user process where, where the individual aspects are very important. When you're interfacing with water, I mean, that's, that's really where, where it is, I, I think. But it's the same with media at home in a lounge, watching television, where you have those, let's say, intimate pockets of, of direct contact. Um, it's heightened. I mean, I think it's interesting with architecture and design in particular, looking at you know, the topic of the, what's happened over the last 50 years, I think as we've moved from orthographic projection and sections, you know, I, I often used to think, how could people design a building? How could people have designed a product in two dimensions. It's crazy because we move through the spaces in 3D. So one of the big developments I think in technology also has been the fact that we can we can replicate those environments I think in a much better way. In products in particular we can look at three-dimensional things with 3D printing, print models out quickly, you know, really understand the ergonomy and the fit or finish of an object. And in buildings when you can start to create them in 3D and you can start to apply surfaces and materials and texture mm. and lighting and all of a sudden I think you can start to anticipate in a much better way how one might experience that particular space so and I think it's I think that's a really positive thing about how technology has brought this three-dimensional aspect to our to our design process and as a final point you you have talked in the past about grower and the way in which um, the technologies and the products that you were developing we're allowing much greater user control, the presetting of, of temperatures, yeah. if you like, some inbuilt knowledge, or you might almost say on the part of the product about the needs and desires of the consumer. And in, this, in that notion of prediction, you know, the history of the next time somebody wants a shower is one thing. But do you think that trend of products and environments, sort of immersive environments, if one wants to use that phrase, is that the way you see things moving, that increasingly we will be able to program or even just allow the systems and the products around us to understand what we're probably going to want, so that we have to make fewer choices about minutiae? Yeah, I think... I mean, I one would hope that that would be the direction technology would be going in because that's when it becomes useful, you know, not when it's demanding. So, you know, we all have different, let's say, pieces of technology that help us. Navigation, for example. You know, I can remember the transition from maps to navigation systems. And, you know, and people were quite nervous about that in a sense. But I can't imagine going anywhere now without navigation. It's just so easy. It helps you get from one point to another in a really efficient way that allows you to spend more time and experience interesting things. You could argue you no longer get lost, so you lose the, the concept of wandering freely and, and discovering new things. So there's always a positive and a negative, I, I guess. But I think technology in general will start to be, I would say, it will, be, it will move from more passive applications, so it serves us, we control it, to more active. It will start to anticipate, it is starting to anticipate. The bathroom is moving from passive digital that we control to active digital. In the next five to ten years, I would expect um, diagnostics coming into the bathroom, technology really being able to monitor as much as we like our health and well-being, you know, tell us things about our physiological state as well as, let's say, our emotional and, uh, and even uh, medical, let's say, 
um, state. So, so I think technology is going to help us in lots of lots of different layers, and I think it's going to definitely evolve, like I say, into this more active state. Paul Flowers, thank you very much. My pleasure. Nice to see you.